it is time for a story. Um, yes, that is why we're here. So, get comfortable. Get your story listening face on. Do you have a story listening face? Do I have a storytelling face? That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Anyway, get comfortable. While oh, you're doing that, I'll tell you that this podcast and all of these stories are supported by patrons. So, if you like them and you want to become a patron too, I would like that. <laughs> you can do that on patreon.com forward slash can I tell you a story. You will receive bonus stories. Secret squirrel stories that are just for you and the other patrons. And more things. You can find out about it on patreon.com forward slash can I tell you a story. Now... If you have your story listening face on or a rough equivalent approximation of that, pretty sure I have my storytelling face on. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. I should stop talking and start telling you a story, which is still technically talking. But anyway, it's a different kind of talking. Let's begin. There were twin cities once. Because of the stone they could quarry, one city was black and the other was white. They were called by those that lived there the City of Shadows and the City of Light, though their official names had far less poetry in them. They sat on either side of a great tidal river that was so wide it was hard to see one bank from the other. It could only be forded when the tide was low. If you were too slow or set out too late, the water would rise again and you'd be gone, belonging now to the ocean. Unless you had a boat. Jem had a boat. It was painted green and it had eyes carved into the prow so it could see the way across. He also had a cat, a mangy, dust-coloured thing with one eye and half an ear and a meow that sounded like the end of days. The cat didn't have a name. Most of the time it was just the two of them, so Jem figured it should know who he was talking to. In the mornings when mist hung on the water like the river was trying to become the sky, he'd pull his boat down the mud-slick bank with the cat sitting in the front like a figurehead. That time of day, squatting in the mist, the city of light on the far side looked like a ghost city, floating, unmoored. Once the sun came all the way up and burned away the mist, the white stone city was so bright it made you squint to look at it. Facing west, looking back towards the city of shadows, Jem would pick up the oars and pull, the wood smooth under his palms. Reaching more or less halfway across the wide green river, he'd stop to fish, maybe catch a thing or two. He fed the small ones to the cat, kept the rest to swap for a pastry filled with whatever was going from the busy market on the other side. It spilled from the city of light and ran all the way down to the ford. More days than not, he passed Ez, rowing the other way in a similar boat, but his was painted blue and had no eyes watching for the way across. Instead, it was ringed with writing, Ez said was magic words. They were written in a language Jem couldn't read, so he had to take Ez's word for it. Sometimes they'd talk for a bit, out in the middle of the river, suspended in the still moments before the tide turned. Just as Jem was drawn like a magnet to the dazzling brightness of the city of light, most days Ez, open-faced and curious, would row across to the black city for the hell of it spend his restlessness walking the streets, stealing to keep himself fed, and if he wasn't hungry, to keep himself entertained. That's how he'd ended up with a carved stone that didn't have a single flat surface to put it down on. He'd been standing on one leg, watching a pigeon on a lamppost, when a man had walked past. Ez stopped watching the pigeon and watched the man instead. His shadow looked like it belonged to someone else, and the mystery of it called Ez to follow. He thought he'd like to know how to steal a shadow, if, if that's what the man had done. They walked a maze through the city of shadows, followed and following, crossing and recrossing their own trail until, by a low, crumbling wall, the man had been stopped by a word spoken from deep in an overhanging doorway. Ez couldn't see the second man's shadow to see if it was strange too, or if his was a shadow of the regular sort. The doorway man placed the curling stone on the crumbling wall, laid carefully on a bundled cloth so it wouldn't roll away, as the men hunted for hidden purses in the folds of their clothing. Ez crept closer, 
a shadow inside of the shadows, close enough to hear the man he'd been following speak. A city needs more than only shadows, more than only light, he said. It had the sound of a litany or an argument, the tired belief that had been said many times before. If there was a reply, Ez didn't hear it, and by the time a hand reached for the curling stone again, it was gone, because Ez was carrying it in his own hands, retreating fast enough to get clear away, but slow enough that he would not be noticed while he did it. Now, Ez lay back in his boat in the middle of the wide green river, and held the curling stone up to the sky with both hands. It slipped from his grasp, and he only just managed to roll to one side to avoid copping it in the eye. It wobbled and slid to the bottom of his boat with a muffled thud and rocked there, a hollow wooden sound on the boards. What was that? Ez looked up to see whose voice was talking and saw Jem drawing alongside. Jem threw the end of a rope for Ez to catch and they tied their boats together so they wouldn't drift apart. This is the thing I found, said Ez. What thing? I don't know. The man with the screwy shadow was being secret about it, so I wanted to know what it was. It's just a weird stone thing. It doesn't do anything, and you can't put it down. Maybe he was an angel, that man. Angels are meant to have wrong shadows. Didn't look like any angel I've seen. How many angels have you seen? Ez threw a flat look across the gap between their boats. My city's got angels everywhere, carved all over everything. Everywhere the light touches, angels. You're always over there, you've seen. Carvings aren't real life. Like your city queen, she looks nothing like her carvings. She's got way more chins in real life. Ez said nothing, trying to remember the exact shape and movement of one shadow in a city made of shadows. They floated for a while, staring up at the wide, cloudless sky, until the ripples of the turning tide started pulling at their boats, the curling stone rolling with the movement. Can I see it? said Jem. Ez handed the stone across. It was heavier than Jem thought it'd be. The cat looked at it with its one eye and went back to washing its paws. Jem turned the stone over in his hands. It felt restless. There was no comfortable way to hold it, no way to comfortably put it down. It's a key, said Jem, surprising himself. How do you know? I just know. My ma is a seer at the temple. Not the main temple, one of the little ones in the street of angels where all the beggars go. I don't see that much, not like her, but sometimes I know true things. Oh, said Ez with easy acceptance. A key to what? Treasure? He sat up straighter, eyes gleaming. I'm going to buy that big black house by the ford, the one with the fence all round and the spiky gate by the jetty. You can come and visit, if you want. Mm, not treasure. What then? I don't know. It feels like trying to remember a dream. Jem held the curling stone out to Ez over the water, wondering what would happen if he dropped it. What door would never open? What gate would never swing wide? Who would mind the most? And would they know it was him who lost the key? What are you going to do with it? I don't know. You keep it. Stash it somewhere. Drop it in the river. Whatever. I can't sell it, can I? I think we need to find the angel. What if it unlocks something important? Then it stays locked, doesn't it? No, I'm staying well out of angels. The tide tugged at their boats, pulling them towards the river mouth. Ez untied his boat and waved at Jem, letting his boat continue to drift, while Jem found his oars again and rowed towards the bright city, carved with angels, his belly demanding the market. Jem swapped a fish for a pastry full of spiced potatoes and onions, the curling stone heavy in his pocket, dragging his tunic down on one side. The city of light gleamed as he wandered, looking at carvings of angels. A hand touched his arm and he jumped. He looked up into the face of a man. Jem was no good at guessing ages, but he was grey around the temples, wearing white like the city. Jem had the feeling this man belonged to the bright city in a way he'd never sensed from Ez or the pastry woman at the market. Excuse me, said the man. 
He shifted into the sunlight, and although shadows are harder to see in the City of Light, they're still there. Jem saw the shadow didn't fit the man. He saw what might be wings. You're looking for your key, said Jem. The man smiled like the sun had come out just for him, a pleased, peaceful kind of smile. I'm one of the people looking for a key, he said. Will you tell me what it opens, said Jem. Something that should never have been closed, said the man. Some of us think that a city needs more than only shadows, more than only light. Jem was quiet, wondering if he should know what that meant. May I have the key, please? The man waited with no hint of urgency or impatience. Jem had no sense that there was a wrong answer or a right one. He knew that either yes or no would be accepted. I didn't steal it, said Jem, overcome with the need to have this white-clothed angel man think well of him to stay pleased with him. I know, said the angel man. I want to see when you turn it. You can carry it till we get there then. Come on. The angel man walked out of the city and down to the ford. The tide was out, receding further. Some cycles of the moon drew the water back further than others, and this was the furthest Jem had ever seen it go. The man stopped in the centre of the river stepped off the well-worn fording path and walked a little way upstream along the riverbed. He chose where he placed his feet, careful not to take too big a step so that Jem's shorter legs could follow in his footsteps. In the middle of the river was a stone, standing on its end, hewn into a pillar. In the side of a pillar was a hole that bent the eye to look at it. You can do the honours if you like, said the angel man. Jem looked at him, unsure thinking of Ez and his aversion to angels. He looked back at the stone, standing in the baking mud of the riverbed, took the curling stone from his pocket and held it in both hands. It took him some time to find the right way to feed it into the pillar. When it made its final turn and settled, there was a feeling of rightness, but nothing else happened. He looked up at the angel man again, frowning slightly. This used to be one city once, said the angel man, not seeming bothered by nothing happening. Long enough ago that even the stories have forgotten that it was so. A proud city, too proud maybe, full of shadows, full of light. The people of the city believed they were the embodiment of unity, day and night, the full moon and the new, together. They became rigid, idolising the perfect denying the cycles of nature even as they were born and died. Jem dragged his eyes from the angel man's face, looking in turn at the dark city and the light. The angel man kept talking. Eventually, one man found the secret to eternal life. The city would be unchanging, perfect, forever. The angels broke the city in half then and sang the river wide enough that the halves could never join again unless you had the key. The river rippled. Though it didn't feel to Jem like the ripple of the returning tide, his worried eyes found the calm eyes of the angel man and he took a breath. The ground began to move, pools of water and mud sliding away to either side. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, the ford began to lift from the river rising into a bridge with elegant arches like a many-legged beast. The shouts of alarm from the people atop this strange animal's back turned to wonder, and people began to flock from the cities on both sides, needing to be present so later they could tell the story. They could say, I was there. Jem looked up at the angel man. Why did you put it back? Like a cloud, sadness passed over the angel man's face for a moment. It's been long enough that even the stories have forgotten. There used to be one city here, not two, he said. Long enough that even the prophecy was forgotten. What prophecy? That a thief chasing an angel would cause the key to fall into the hands of the one who waits to receive it. The city should be more than only shadows, more than only light. The angel man smiled at Jem and left him, 
walked along the new arched bridge towards the city of shadows, already seeming brighter in the light of the afternoon sun. Jem walked slowly through the crowds, back to where he'd left his boat. He rowed into the middle of the wide green river. Ez was already there in his own boat, in the shade under the new bridge, fishing with no bait on the line. They floated together and didn't talk. The cat blinked its one eye and washed its paws. Thanks for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this story and enjoyed wearing your story listening face. If you don't know what I'm talking about, neither do I. So that's all right. You're in good company. If you did enjoy this story and you want to practice wearing your story listening face some more, there are lots more stories on patreon.com forward slash can I tell you a story. So you might like to go and check them out. Until next time, watch the shadows of the people you pass. If you find someone with a wrong shadow, maybe they're an angel.